Welcome back to video three of seven in our intro to Cassandra for Developers Crash Course, Tables, Partitions, and Examples. So in this section, we're just gonna go over the basic components of what creates cells, rows, tables, and such, and then get into a little bit more discussion on data modeling in Cassandra. So the first thing here is a cell. A cell is essentially just the intersection of a row and a column. Uh, anyone who's ever worked with an Excel spreadsheet or a tabular format you might see in a relational database will be really familiar with what this is. Then if we step back a level and we look at a row, right, this is going to be a single structured data item in a table. And rows are comprised usually of multiple related cells, right? So we see in this case, I have four cells uh, with values one, John, Doe, and Wizardry, and these are related together in a single row. In Cassandra, partitions are the base physical unit of access. So this is how the data is stored physically on disk. So let's take a look at the example here and notice to the very right, we have the department column and all the values are wizardry. Now in this example, we have set department as our partition key, which means we're just partitioning by department. Well, even though I have three rows here, given that each one of the rows has the same partition key, same wizardry, partition key, these are actually all stored in the same physical partition. So these are actually stored together and they're also retrieved together. So if I were to then say uh, select star from this table where department equals wizardry, I would get back all of these values. Now, if we go ahead and step back even uh, further and look at a table now that has multiple partitions. So again, in this case, I have three rows that hasn't changed. But look at our department. Notice it's wizardry, dark magic, and devrel. Again, since I'm partitioning by department, I would actually have three separate physical partitions here, wizardry, dark magic, and devrel, even though I, I have three rows. So in my single logical table, if I were to select star from this table, I would get back all three rows that I see, but I would actually be accessing three separate physical partitions in my cluster. Okay, so let's step back even further, right? And now you can see um, a key space. So a key space is just a container of tables. It's where you set replication, it contains the tables. It's similar to a database or a schema from a relational database. And then within the key space, I have any of my tables. And again, just like we were talking about, I have my rows and columns there. And, and those tables are separated into our physical partitions based off of our partition key. So let's go ahead and look at a concrete example because I really like concrete examples as a way to really illustrate things. So in this example here, you see we have a killer video key space. So that contains my tables. And in this case, we have a table called users by city. Now I want you to notice the convention here. I want users partitioned by city. So that's how we do that. We say the by, and then whatever that is, is what I'm partitioning by. So in this example, we're partitioning by city. So notice I have two two different values for city phoenix and seattle these are my physical partitions now again logically if i were to select star from this table i would see everything that you see here underneath the hood physically i would actually be storing my data in two physical partitions phoenix and seattle now notice how both phoenix and seattle have multiple rows of data and what we've done here is we set what's called a clustering column so you can use clustering columns for order or uniqueness because it's important that your primary key uniquely identifies a row, right? With ordering in a clustering column, take a look at last name. Notice how last name in Phoenix is Helson, Lastfall, and Smith. Well, clustering columns by their nature, what they'll do is as data is being written into the database, the data is going to be naturally ordered for those types that fit this kind of thing. In a case of a text field, it's alphanumeric. So H comes before L, B comes before S, and so on. So again, that's automatically happening. It's actually stored that way on disk. Anything that's not a partition key or a clustering column are what we call data columns. This is essentially the payload of your data, right? So most of the time, I'll be selecting by some values uh, that are in my partition key and my where clause and my clustering columns, and then I will be getting whatever data I have in the table. And then if you look at then how do we create a table, this should look very familiar to you if you've come from the relational world uh, with SQL. It, matter of fact, CQL is a subset of SQL, uh, so and that's on purpose. It's there to really kind of help folks who've been doing things with SQL kind of come back to a natural home, if you will. It's a language that everyone knows, and it's been very well indoctrinated over decades. So we're using that here. So if we look at the syntax, we have create table. I'm going to use my key space dot whatever the table name is. 
I'll set up a set of column definitions, um, city, last name, first name, whatever they happen to be in their types. And then really at the bottom, that's the key thing we're getting at is the primary key. So take a look at what's happening here. In all tables in Cassandra, by the way, you must include at least one partition key, that's city. So we're saying we're going to partition by city. Anything else that comes after that are clustering columns. Now notice the parens that are around city. That's also denoting a partition key. Now, the reason why we're using parens, it's just a good mechanism to use to denote what the partition key is. Also, if you're using a composite partition key, you have to include the parens to tell CQL these columns belong to my partition key. So it's just a good idea to always include the parens. That way, if you just have one column in your partition key, well, it's very clear which one's your partition key. And if you happen to be using a composite, you also very clearly know that is the partition key. So the real thing that you want to keep in mind with a primary key is that it must ensure uniqueness. Its real primary purpose is to ensure that a row is unique. And it may also define sorting with what we call clustering columns. The key thing to take away here is that primary keys really are to define a unique row. Then if you take a look at the partition key itself, that is used to partition our rows. So again, when I was talking about uh, the convention we use, where I have like users by city, I, I want some, some data, I want my users, I'm gonna partition by city. Okay, so let's take a look at clustering columns. Uh, clustering columns are really there uh, to either sort, define sorting, or uniqueness. Now in the first example that we have, uh, let's take a look at the uniqueness example. Notice how the first example says city, last name, and first name, but it's got that big red X that says not unique. Why is this? Imagine what might happen if I had, say, two Jane Does or John Does in the same city. So city Orlando, last name Doe, first name Jane. Well, in Cassandra, last right wins, right? So what would happen is if I inserted some data using that first example for Jane Doe and Orlando, and then later on I had another Jane Doe in Orlando, a different Jane Doe, then the last run would effectively just overwrite the first one, last right wins. So again, since the primary purpose of the primary key is to ensure uniqueness of a row, look at what we've done there in the good example where we've added email. So I have, I'm partitioning by city, then clustering by last name, first name, and then email. Why? Because email is what we call a natural key. Um, you generally are not gonna have two of those that are shared between two different people. Um, so if I then had two Jane Does in Orlando, well, guess what? They're gonna have different emails. Now I can ensure that that row is unique. Now, if you take a look at the bottom example here, this is one example of sorting. So in the first example, I am partitioning by video ID, uh, but then I'm clustering by common ID. Now, if I have a case in my UI or my app where for every video, I wanna be able to show all of the comments, that's wonderful and this will work. However, comments usually make more sense when they're in time order, right? If I have a set of comments on a video uh, and then later on I view them, if they're all just shown to me in a random order, they're not gonna make much sense as, as far as a conversation goes. So in the bottom example there, notice that we added created at as a clustering column. So what's gonna happen now is Cassandra is going to naturally sort that. So remember, clustering columns can be used for either sorting or uniqueness. So in this case, what we're doing is we're partitioning by video ID, we're ordering by created at, and uh, then we're using comment ID for uniqueness. So not only do I have a unique row for each video and comment combination, but at the same time, because of created at, those comments will be automatically and naturally sorted in time. That way, when they're returned to me, they'll be sorted in the way that I would expect a conversation to happen. Okay, so some rules of a good partition. First thing is you wanna to store together what you retrieve together. Really what it comes down to is you want to be able to, whatever you store together, when you go to retrieve it later, you wanna retrieve it in one read or the fewest amount of reads as possible. So going back to the example I was using a moment ago, let, let's say I'm looking at a YouTube app. Uh, when I look at the video, I also wanna retrieve those comments. So the first example does exactly that. For any given video, I'm gonna retrieve all the comments for that video in one read. The second example there, though, notice it's partitioned by common ID. And then I have, you know, I'm clustering by created at, that's great. I'm gonna have these ordered comments, but I will have a separate partition for every single comment. That means if I had a video that had a thousand comments, I would then have to iterate through all thousand of those comments and queries to be able to get those back, right? So I'm not storing together what I retrieve together. The first example is in one read, I can retrieve all the data. And the second example, I have to do 
a lot of subsequent queries to get all my data put together. So another thing you want to avoid are big partitions, right? So Cassandra has some pretty nice limits as, as far as, you know, it's technically unbounded. However, there are practical limits on how big your partitions can get and how many rows you should really store in them. And this all really comes down to maintaining your performance at scale, right? Because Cassandra is all about being able to maintain your very tight SLAs and your read and write performance at scale. So what this really comes down to is once you start to get around 100,000 rows per partition, you really need to break it up. It's the same thing if you get to about 100 megabytes per partition. The key thing you don't want is to cause what we call unbounded partition growth or have particularly large partitions. So let's take a look at our examples here. Notice the first example. We're partitioning by video ID. We have our created at and our common ID. So in this particular case, yeah, you know, if I have a particularly popular video, I may end up with 100,000 comments per video, but probably not, right? And for the particular payload, I'm, I'm probably going to be within my 100 megabyte um, size limit as well. Now, in the example on the bottom, though, the one with the red X, I'm partitioning by country, and then I'm clustering by user ID. What might happen if I had a country like India, and I'm storing a row for every single person in India? How many billion people are in India right now. So I'm completely going to go past the 100,000 row practical limit here. Um, and, and that would actually grow you know, pretty large. So again, the top one is keeping me within my limits where the bottom one there has a very good chance to grow pretty big. Now, another thing you want to avoid are unbounded partitions. So take a look at this IoT example. The first example here we give, notice we have, we're partitioning by our sensor ID and then report it at, right? So report it at is going to be the time that some data comes in or something like that. Now, what might happen though if, if for a particular sensor, we're reporting data every five seconds or every 10 seconds, right? Um, I could end up with a significant growth in a very short period of time. How much data might this turn out to be, say, in a month, a year, right? And it's totally unbounded. There is nothing to limit the size of this partition for one particular sensor. So what I want to do is what we call bucketing. Notice now what happened to my partition key. Instead of just sensor ID, it's sensor ID and month year. So now we're, we're bucketing this by the month and a year. So for each month, what's going to happen, I'm, I'm going to be capped. I'll be capped at the amount of data I get for any particular sensor in a month, right? So this way I can now properly size and kind of anticipate what the size of my data is going to be. And the top example, it, it's completely unbounded and that partition would just continue to grow. And then the last one here is you want to avoid hot partitions. Now there is a relationship or can be a relationship to big partitions. A hot partition really just means a case where one partition is really getting hit compared to all the other ones, like all the read requests are going there. And what it does, it ends up in an unbalanced cluster, right? Where I have just a subset of nodes that are taking on the brunt of all of my operations and requests. So going back to our country example that we used before in India, imagine the difference I might have in the reads, the amount of reads that I have to a partition. If I have some kind of app that has lots of users logging in and using it, and I have a country like India compared to a country like Iceland, India has a lot more orders of magnitude, more people in it than Iceland does. And for this particular app, we're just going to assume that that means I also have a lot more folks that are constantly hitting that India partition, right? So this is a case where I very well may have a hot partition where I have one partition that's really taking all the lion's share of my operations and unbalancing my cluster. Alrighty, so that wraps it up here for video three of seven, partitions, tables, and examples. Join me for video four next as we do an exercise.